It's almost here. The seventh annual Annapolis Film Festival opens on Thursday, March 21st in Annapolis and rolls on for four solid days. This year, the festival features more than 80 films along with dozens of panels, Q&A sessions, and yes, my favorite, the parties. Tickets and passes are available at AnnapolisFilmFestival.com, but right now we're diving in a little bit deeper and speaking with the faces behind the films, directors, producers, and actors. You want some insight to what you don't usually get? Well, here you go. Hey, joining us today, and we're going to be talking about the Annapolis Film Festival again, and one of the really cool movies that I want to see, which uh, is sort of eye-opening when I saw the synopsis, was General Magic. And uh, just the synopsis says, from the first smartphones to touchscreens, eBay to emojis, the tech that dominates our lives, we're born at a startup nobody's ever heard of called General Magic. And it's a tale of how great vision, grave betrayal, and epic failure changed the world. And joining us today is Tom Hershenson, who worked with General Magic, and I believe you were the head of PR at one point. I, I was the head of PR at one point. I started as kind of the, the second banana on the PR team, and then uh, I rose to become banana number one. Bana- banana number one. Life goals. Life exactly. goals, for sure. You hear about tech companies, you hear, okay, Microsoft, and you've got Bill Gates in the garage, and you've got Steve Jobs and Wozniak and everything else here like this, but this actually sort of predated that or, or was running well, under the radar back then? Well, General Magic was actually had a, has a, a different kind of birth story than most um, companies in Silicon Valley. It was never really a traditional startup in terms of guys in the garage. It was spun out of Apple. The founder of General Magic was a guy named Mark Peratt, and he in the mid to late 80s was what we would call a futurist. I mean, he was a guy who was at a think tank thinking very deeply about where technology was going to go. He got hired by Apple, and he persuaded John Scully, who was the CEO of Apple at the time, to set up an independent company that would try to make the first what we would now call a smartphone. So it was uh, well-funded and well-stocked with just wonderfully talented people from day one, and uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a bunch of guys you know, trying to bootstrap something. It really had a, a long runway to take off in terms of people and resources. Where did this all fit in? And I remember I, I tend to be on the tech wave and I, I remember I had a Palm Pilot uh, at one point and this predates that, or is this about that time? It's about that time. It, it's uh general magic, if I'm remembering correctly, and uh, I, I turned 50 in two weeks. So uh, my memory is as sharp as ever. <laughs> ha ha. It was founded, formally spun out in about 1992 or maybe 1993. And the Palm Pilot, if I recall, kind of came on the scene uh, maybe 93 or 94. And the big difference was, you know, we always positioned ourselves as making something that was centered around communications, whereas the Palm Pilot and the Newton and other similar devices were really tracking information. The, the acronym used back then was Personal Informational Information Manager, or PIM, whereas we talked about being a personal communicator and, you know, really having kind of a, a different center of gravity in terms of what we were trying to do. But we we're all con- competitors, all contemporaries, Newton, Palm Pilot, and um, there were a, a slew of other devices that uh, are on the trash heap of tech history. Now, now, you mentioned the Newton, which was an Apple product, and you said you were spun off of Apple? Yeah, we were spun off from Apple, and really the, the Newton, which was announced, I think it was announced in 94 – um, that uh, came came to us out of left field because it was essentially the idea that we were trying to do. And Apple had funded General Magic and was aligned with General Magic and then kind of out of nowhere. And the film gets into us, it kind of gets stabbed in the back from Apple where they announced that they're going to have a, a product that's going to compete fairly directly with what we were trying to do. And we had been very, very quiet PR-wise at that point. We had kept things under wraps because we, we knew that we had to have the technology sufficiently far along so that when we did PR, people would actually have something they could feel and touch and that worked and uh, that would bring the concept to life. So all of a sudden, kind of the ground was uh, cut out from under us when Apple, our supposed you know parent and ally, announced that they're going to do something that in many ways replicated exactly what they had spun us out to do. Interesting. Did General Magic ever produce a product, a, a, a consumer product? General Magic didn't. General Magic was a, a software company. So we created an operating system called Magic Cap that ran on devices that were made by Sony and Motorola and Panasonic and Philips also were working on devices as well. 
So we were kind of following a, a Microsoft-like model of not being in the hardware business. However, I should say that General Magic created what was called a reference design. So we had a, a, a bunch of electrical engineers and chip designers who created uh, a design that other companies would use to build their products modeled after. Then they could add different features and different functionality as they saw fit. It's a little bit like the Android model where there's a kind of a um, an Android kernel, as I understand it, and different phone manufacturers can kind of add to it or tweak to it as they see fit. But there's a there's a kind of core Android software. We did the same thing with we had kind of a core set of hardware that any device was going to have, and then we had the operating system that would run on those devices. Apple, like you said, Apple pulled the rug out from under you guys. And I, I know the tech world can be dog eat dog and uh, down and dirty and nasty and everything else. Is there anything to prevent that from happening now with any of the tech companies? I mean, what's changed in your view since you've seen you know so many? You know, we're going on twenty twenty plus years of this now. Yeah, we see this. We see this. I mean, the the big thing that uh, I think has heightened is uh, non disclosures and non competes and things like that. That really um, uh, tech companies are very aggressive about protecting their intellectual property, aggressive about making sure that key people who leave a company aren't going to go off and start something that competes. So um, at the end of the day, it's a cadre of lawyers, I think, more than anything, that's stopping a repeat of this. But part of what you have to remember is being spun out from Apple, the initial intellectual property that General Magic had was shared by Apple. So it wasn't something that General Magic could really put a stop to in terms of claiming that there was theft of trade secrets or things like that. Uh, and that's part of the reason it was such a such a bind for us once uh, once Newton was announced because we didn't really have recourse in the traditional way. It also, you know, getting bogged down in lawsuits when you're a startup is uh, probably at the bottom of the list of things you want to do. It's interesting to see, and I know that Megan Smith, who is also going to be joining you for a Q&A after the film, which incidentally is premiering here at the Annapolis Film Festival on Saturday at noon at St. John's College in their key auditorium. But Megan was instrumental in General Magic as well, and she has moved on. And the last I had heard, she was uh, and, well, an MIT graduate, and she was President Obama's uh, head of IT or head of uh, – there was, there was a fancy name that they give these government Yeah, workers. chief technology officer. Yeah, um, exactly. And where where did everybody end up with General Magic from when you were there? I mean, did they go on to, to work for Apple or to Microsoft and whatnot, or did they – some people have come full circle. Uh, Kevin Lynch, who worked at General Magic, uh, is now head of the Apple Watch at Apple. Tony Fidel, who is retired now, essentially, um, uh, he was instrumental in the iPod and then the iPhone at Apple. And then he went on to create and found Nest with its family of devices, starting with the intelligent thermostat. Uh, Megan's had a long and storied career, both as CTO. She was at Google for a while. Uh, she now has a nonprofit called Shift Seven, which is really about harnessing the transformational power of technology for social causes. Pierre Omidar, maybe some people have heard of him. He was uh, at General Magic um, and left to found eBay. Several other people left to found a company that, that uh, is now defunct, but Web TV, which Microsoft bought in the mid to late 90s and was the first attempt to have a, a browser and web access on people's televisions. So there are, there are a ton of you know notable successes coming out of it. Most of the people who worked at General Magic are still in the technology industry. Some are at Apple. Most are in Silicon Valley. Um, some are a little bit further afield from that. But uh, for a lot of us, it was a really crushing experience because General Magic was aiming so high. I mean, we really thought we were doing something that would transform the world. And when the company failed, uh, that was a, a really bitter failure for a lot of us. You know, fast forward 25 years and come to find out that the ideas we had were correct. The execution was flawed. But and you'll see this in the film. Mark Peratt, the founder of General Magic in 1988, drew a sketch of a device that did not exist at that point, and he described what the device would be able to do. And he pulls out of his pocket an iPhone in the documentary, and he lays it right next to the picture. And they, they look essentially the same, and the functionality is essentially the same. So that's a long-winded answer to a simple question. But I, I think everybody at General Magic really – was passionate about technology and um, the vast, vast, vast majority of us remain that way and are still working in the technology field. 
Just curious, as, as we see all the technology that's around here in the websites, I mean, we've got the social media, we've got Facebook, we've got Snapchats and everything else that's gone there. You mentioned eBay. Obviously, you guys had some sort of a vision on personal communications back then. Could you foresee where we are today back then? We didn't. You know, we foresaw, we foresaw that people would be connected by devices that were very personal and portable and that there would be many ways of communicating through them, that there would be many different applications that would run on them. Um, we foresaw software as a service where instead of buying a piece of software, you'd have a subscription-based model. Um, emojis uh, came out of General Magic. What eventually became the USB port came out of General Magic. So there was a lot of stuff that we were really right on with. And that's what makes it such a such a fascinating story, how this company that got so much right ended up getting so much wrong. The social network side of it was not something that we were really focused on at the company, and I don't think anybody anticipated how much it would um, explode, you know, as it's done over the past decade. We thought people would be much more closely connected, but we didn't anticipate kind of the, the details of how people would socialize in networks um, in years to come. What do you what do you see for ten years, twenty years from now? Do you have any any crystal balls? Uh, not any crystal balls that are are clear. Um, they're pretty cloudy. I mean, I'm very concerned about um, social media. You know, there's I was thinking about in advance of this interview. There's a, a great book that came out in the late seventies called Four Arguments for the Elimination of Television. And in it, a guy who's a former ad executive said, you know. TV is just a technology that trends in a certain way. It creates certain social results. And I fear very much that we're going to see a lot more problems around social media in terms of it being corrosive for our politics and corrosive for how people interact and get along with each other. So I'm not, I'm not an unalloyed technology optimist. I mean, I think there will be amazing innovations in terms of devices and in terms of products and services that are going to be out there. Um, I'm hoping the good outweighs the bad. I think that, you know, nanotechnology and biotech are new frontiers that are going to be um, really profound in the next 20 years. But like I said, um, I'm probably my prognostications are worth what people listening to this podcast paid for them. So uh, take it with a grain of salt. That, that's true. And I, I do agree with you. I think that social media has, you know, certainly a, a very sharp double edged sword there. And it's just yeah. so so beautiful that I mean, I've been able to connect through high school you know, classmates that I haven't seen in decades and, and we're, we're virtually very tight, but then you look and you hear about all the different bullying that goes on there. And I mean, just, you know, for, you know, just most recently, the, the shooting down in New Zealand in Christchurch was done on Facebook live from what I understand, um, which is just an entirely different uh, ball of wax there. And you're, a hundred percent right from what I can see is just the the good technology that's coming out of what's being developed in the hospitals and the the way to be able to you know records and be able to transport you know different things. I mean, I know, gosh, in my iPhone, I can turn around and if I get in a car wreck, I can tell access what kind of blood type I have and what allergies and everything yeah. else, um, which is absolutely fantastic. This just blows my mind that this technology was here, this presence was to be able to sit there and look into the future, and it just didn't work. Um, yeah, there's a great there's a great clip in it where um, and, and there's there's a ton of archival footage. I mean, General Magic had a cinematographer that was documenting the company pretty much from day one. Well, sure, you guys so were a startup. That's what they do uh, out there, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and um, you you just see a lot of remarkable footage that was filmed during the you know the heat of the moment. And in one, uh, Megan Smith is being interviewed, showing a prototype of the device we were trying to make, and it's as big as a hardback book. I mean, it's it's not portable in any sense of the word. And the interviewer asks, well, how big will it be eventually? And she she narrows her hands to the size of a, a, a smartphone today. And she says, um, eventually, um, there'll be wristwatches like this. So it's just stunning to think that, you know, in 1996, people saw that far ahead about what was coming down the pike. And it really is kind of the most successful failure in Silicon Valley that no one's ever heard of because um, the idea has really succeeded, but the company is a, a case study in going out too early and all the kinds of problems that can doom a company. It really is. I was looking at the wiki page for General Magic, and it said that you guys were rumored to have rabbits in the office. Is there truth to that? <laughs> there is truth. There's a rabbit and there was a parrot. Um, it was a place where people were working long and hard. I mean, 
you know, we used to joke that if they had laundry service, no one would ever leave because we did have meal service for lunch and dinner. And people built bunks in their cubes. I mean, that's how hardcore the place was in terms of the work ethic. Uh, there was a bunny uh, rabbit named Bowser, and I forget the name of the parrot. But it was a place where, you know, hijinks were totally tolerated. I mean, there was a paint pellet gun war once uh, between um, a few guys who wanted to blow off some steam. There were remote-controlled racing cars racing around the office. Uh, the engineers decided that they wanted to have a satellite TV and on their own accord without asking anyone's permission. They got a satellite dish on the TV back in the day when those things were, you know, 10 feet wide uh, and installed a projection TV, just took over a conference room and installed a projection TV. So it was really a place that was, um, I don't want to say wild in a kind of... Uh, a hedonistic sense, but wild in terms of great creativity, great passion, great energy. And it came out, whether it was seeing a bunny hop through the hallways or people, you know, just uh, building crazy stuff for their own comfort or amusement. Tech companies that you hear, the you know, the Googles and the Microsofts and the, the benefits and perks they have in their campuses today just make me so jealous as I sit here and look at my cat looking up at me from the floor going like, feed me. That's that's about the biggest perk I get here. So I, I'm totally jealous with that. Oh, it's it's way beyond anything that we experienced at General Magic. I mean, I was at, you know, visiting a, a, a former General Magic colleague at Google over the summer and we went to have lunch. He took me to lunch and they have I don't know how many different restaurant choices that you can pick from different cuisines. Um, and I said, you know, can I buy? And he said, what are you talking about? Google buys for everybody. And I mean, these are, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of people on that campus who are eating every day, you know, and it's just, it's considered completely unremarkable to have perks like that, let alone the other stuff that you alluded to. It's kind of interesting that I read an article in the New Yorker recently, and they were talking about Manhattan um, office buildings and where they used to be sort of cubicle farms, you'd have a, a, an off, a company would take over a floor and it would just be a bunch of cubicles. And now what they're finding is they, they can't do that because these companies won't go to buildings like that if they don't have certain amenities. So they've got group, you know, they'll have a craft beer bar, they'll have a, a recreation room, they'll have a, a swimming pool in some of them and different amenities that would be shared among many companies that might indeed build their cubicle farms. But it was the, a, Kind of an interesting note on the real estate market in New York that they need to really adapt to this because even small companies, not the Googles, not the Microsofts, not the Ebays and Amazons of the world, but Billy Bob's Bait and Tackle that may have 12 franchises and this is their headquarters, they need those kind of perks too to attract the good talent. Yeah, it's really trickled down, and it's something that's becoming more and more a must-have and an expectation of, of prospective employees. I mean, I remember when we got the first espresso machine at General Magic, and that was that was a big deal. And now, if you don't have a espresso machine at a company, um, I wonder if someone actually, you know, coming in for an interview is even going to take the place seriously. It, it's if somebody wrote it as part of a fictional comedy, you wouldn't believe it. But that's, you know, these the perks have gotten to a, a level that uh, I don't think was rivaled since the dot com era. Oh my gosh, that's just, I'm, I'm sitting here silently laughing as you say I, it, somebody would turn them down because there's not an espresso machine. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm not going to take too much more of your time, but Tom Hersonson, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. And you were the number one banana in the PR world at General I was. Magic. I was the number one banana. I, I, I'm dying to ask you a question of whether you actually are in front of a kitchen table and it's dirty. Uh, I listened to some back episodes of the podcast, and I'm just I, wondering what I, it, Right now, it is not a kitchen table, but it is dirty. It was a kitchen oh, okay. table. It was a kitchen table at one point. Technically, I'm not in a kitchen. But well, then it, it's not it, a kitchen table. Well, it is a kitchen table. Now we, we have to get into a philosophical debate about whether the uh, location determines the, the table. That's true. We've got to look, find out where mm -hmm. the, uh, I guess, where the punctuation sits, the commas or something. But it is, it, is, it is a dirty table. It used to be in my kitchen. But, hey, Tom, I am looking forward to meeting you in uh, actually a couple of days when you're here in Annapolis for the Annapolis Film Festival. It does get sure. underway Thursday the 21st yeah. and runs through Sunday, the 24th. But the movie that the people that are listening to this need to see is general magic. And it's the story about the tech company that nobody has ever heard of, but probably everybody is thankful that they existed because the technology is literally in the palm of your hands today that they developed. And that is going to be screening on Saturday at noon at St. John's at the key auditorium. And you can get information at annapolisfilmfestival.com. You can get your tickets and everything else there. And if you want to learn a little bit more about the General Magic movie, you can go to General Magic the movie. That seems appropriate for uh, 
a URL. It's, it's, app, it's aptly named, very straightforward, and I really encourage people to go see it. I mean, I, I can't be unbiased about it. I have such fondness for the company, but it's really eye-opening, and um, the, the film is funny, the film is thought-provoking, and uh, I, I think people will really enjoy viewing it. And and I will point out that this is a documentary. This isn't a this isn't somebody's dream of what it was. This is this is the real deal. And as you said, they've got tons of footage there, um, which is certainly unusual for most companies back in 1996. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we will see Megan Smith. She'll be joining you as well for a Q and A yes, after the screening. Yep. And we look forward to seeing you guys on Saturday. Well, I look forward to being there. I really appreciate the time you've given to the interview. Um, I, I hope I've had few uhs and ands and uh have given answers that people actually find interesting uh, according to my daughters i never do that but uh, your kids will lie to you all the time now you do well, Every, well everything was great <laughs> well great thanks so much hey. and uh i look forward to uh seeing folks at the at the screening on saturday absolutely tom thank you very much great thanks so much thank you for joining us to learn a little bit more about the films coming to the annapolis film festival Remember, tickets and passes can be obtained at AnnapolisFilmFestival.com. This is John Frenet, and I'll see you at the movies.